So no church operates for a year without elders or a church board. In contrast, sometimes a pastoral position may be open for, for a year or even, even longer. No church functions, no local church congregation functions without representative church governance for a long period of time. It just can't happen, but I'll tell you what, they can function without a pastor for a long period of time. Representative governance at the congregational level is a necessity. Having a pastor in the local church, just be frank, it's a luxury. Now, having said that, a godly pastor who equips and trains the workers, that's, that's a great asset for a church. If he's faithful to the word, and if he's doing that work, he's an asset. So in terms of rank, a pastor has a church membership just like every other member. He returns tithes and offerings just like every other member. He's subject to church discipline just as every other member is. He has one vote just like every other member. In most circumstances, he will not even exercise his voting rights. So Jesus said, all you are brethren, Matthew 23, verse 8. And in Mark 10, verse 42 and 43, Jesus teaches, those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. So the pastor, he's not the CEO, he's not the military general of the church, he is the chief servant. So the pastor is employed by the local sisterhood of churches. He's, he's not employed directly by the local church. He works for the conference. The local sisterhood of churches is, in many cases, it represents like all the churches in a certain state or a certain province. And that's the way it is where I work here. I work among a, a group. There's a group of pastors that all serve in this state and they are pastoring churches. It's assigned by the conference. It's assigned by the the administration of the conference, they tell you what church you're in and you go there. So I'm not hired or fired by my local church. I'm hired by the conference and I'm assigned or posted to a district or to a particular church. So if I preach something, if I need to address a church discipline issue and the members might get mad and, you know, say, well, we're fi he's fired. We can't have a pastor like that. He's, he's too, too careful. They can't fire me. The conference is who I work for. If I preach something that bends people too far. They say, yeah, you, you more than you step on our toes too much. He's out of here. Well, no, they can't say that because I'm employed by the conference. And so it's just, it's just some checks and balances here in the system that are good for all of us. And we all need to be working together. We shouldn't have an adversarial role. The conference is there to equip the churches. Now, normally the pastor serves as the chairperson of the church board. Now, there are certain limitations. There's actually a number of limitations placed on the pastor as he serves in the church board. And there is some confusion in the church about the authorities that are put there for the pastor in the church board. So, so let's, uh, let's look and see what does the church itself say about the role of the pastor in his local church. And I'm going to start at page 33, again, current edition of the church manual and listen to what the world church says. So here we go. Pastors should not surround themselves with any special body of counselors of their own choosing, but always cooperate with the elected officers. Now, this is talking about the elected officers in the local church. Of course, we should also cooperate with the, the officers in the conference office. That's a given, right? But this is talking about in your local church. The church has elected these different people. One's a Sabbath school superintendent, one is an elder, one is a deacon. We work together. We work with the personal ministries leader. We're all in this together, right? And so the pastor should work with them. So listen to this one and listen close, listen up close. Because the pastor is appointed to the position in the church by the conference, the pastor serves the church as a conference employee, is responsible to the conference executive committee, and maintains a sympathetic and cooperative relation to and works in harmony with all the plans and policies of the local church. Now, I hope you heard some of that. I hope you think about that for a minute. Uh, notice, I work with the, the conference president but I am responsible to the conference executive committee. It's kind of an interesting point. I work with the conference ministerial director, but I am responsible to the, to the conference executive committee. Did you notice here what it said here? I maintain, a pastor is to maintain a sympathetic and cooperative relation to and work in harmony with all the plans and policies of the local church. Well, well, well now wait a minute. I think a lot of pastors maybe didn't read that part. 
They think they should work in harmony, maybe sometimes with some of the plans in the local church. The World Church has assigned me, and this conference has employed me to work in harmony with all the plans and policies of the local church. Interesting, eh? Now, the local church doesn't have carte blanche. The local church can't just decide any which thing. If the local church decides, uh, we're going to change the day of worship here, or we're going to start keeping the tithe all here locally, what? Well, you know, the pastor is authorized to step in and say, ah, ah no, you, that's not authorized. But, but if it's, you know, any other thing that's in harmony with the mission of the world church and the teachings of the church, the pastor just has to work with the group that's there. We're all in this together, right? So it should be the first impulse of the pastor should be to work with his group. And the pastor will help and give guidance and correction. Sometimes he'll have to be even more stringent. But He's working within these bounds. Let's look at another one here on page 79. The pastor should not assume all lines of responsibility, but should share these with the elders and other officers. So I share that with the personal ministries leader, the head deaconess, and so on and so on. All these responsibilities and things that we've parceled out here, we work together. We should see ourselves as part of a team. Not like, you know, the pastor is the general and he's, he's going to tell everybody just exactly what to do. Hey, if the pastor has to be uh, imprisoned or, or something like this happens, persecution happens, the church should be able to continue to function with zero pastor, right? Let's look at another one of these over here on, uh, on page 64. Now check this. I, I mentioned this before, but here is the source in the church manual. The Word of God does not give license for one man to set up his judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church. Neither is he allowed to urge his opinions against the opinions of the church. So at the end of the day, you know, the pastor can't just do everything the way, you know, maybe he thinks that it should all be done. Maybe he has a certain opinion about one thing and the world church has a different opinion about it. Well, he needs to sustain the opinion of the, of the global body. He can't just do his own thing. So some of the safeguards here, some of the things that the world church has decided and assigned, and again, the local church doesn't have everything where the pastor has no authority, but I think you could see that there's a number of limitations and things on the work of the pastor there and checks and balances. Good for everybody. So what if the church invites a guest speaker and the pastor unilaterally cancels it? Well, he can't do that. But let's suppose he's unrepentant. Now, people should labor with him and try to get him to calm down and, and work together with all the plans and policies of the local church. But if he doesn't calm down there, you know, he could. it could be that the local church will decide he needs to be disciplined. Discipline for him won't just necessarily come from the conference. Discipline would come potentially even from his local church, but we'll save that for another presentation. So I heard of a case recently, not on the East Coast, but on the West Coast. This church board invited a guest speaker, this pastor. He's a credentialed, ordained minister. He's not under any discipline. There's no problem with him. And the pastor unilaterally said, oh, he can't come. We don't, we don't want him to come. And the pastor unilaterally canceled the meeting. Does a pastor have authority to do that? And the answer is no. The answer is that the, the, the church board has the authority there. Uh, if there's no issue with that speaker, there's no way the pastor can contravene that. Here in the current edition of the church manual on page 64, listen to this. The word of God does not give license for one man to set up his judgment in opposition to the judgment of the church. Neither is he allowed to urge his opinions against the opinions of the church. The pastor, uh, whether it's the world church, and maybe he believes in something and the world church doesn't, the pastor can't go against the world church. Or even on the local church level, if the local church invites a guest speaker who's within the bounds there, then there's, there's no way the pastor can overrule that. It, it, we just simply don't have that kind of authority. It's not power coming down through the, the bishops to the members, power coming up that Jesus has granted the members that's coming up. Now let's come back to something I said already in this presentation. The pastor normally doesn't vote in a church board meeting. This is one of the key limitations on the pastor. So, like, why? Why? Where do you get this? The church manual doesn't say that the pastor doesn't vote. So then where are you getting this? Well, I'll tell you where I'm getting it. Now, I'm going to refer to Robert's rules here, and somebody might immediately say, hey, wait a minute, that's just a bunch of uh, rules that uh, just, it just means that people can manipulate uh, the board a lot better, and the chairperson gets to run everything. Well, let me tell you what really is going on here. Robert's rules is simply 
a system to protect the rights of the minority and to protect different rights. It's, it's, it's a way to make sure that if you're the minority, you don't just get drowned out. Like maybe if you're the only one or two people in the church that have a certain viewpoint, and uh, well, we'll just, we'll just run over those people because uh, they shouldn't even be heard. Robert's Rules is something that puts a limitation on the power of the majority so that minorities have a fair chance. So that's, don't just throw away Robert's Rules. So uh, let's listen to this, and this is from page 374 and 375 of the current edition. If the presiding officer is a member of the society, he has, as an individual, the same rights in debate as any other member, but the impartiality required of the chair in an assembly precludes his exercising these rights while he is presiding. Normally, especially in a large body, he should have nothing to say on the merits of pending questions. On certain occasions, which should be extremely rare, the presiding officer may believe that a crucial factor relating to such a question has been overlooked and that his obligation as a member to call attention to the point outweighs his duty to preside at that time. To participate in debate, he must relinquish the chair. So in other words, for the, for the chairperson to actually come down from the chair and become involved, engaged in the debate that everybody else is in, uh, even if he's just to point out something he feels was left out, he needs to actually step out of the chair and become part of the rest of the group and someone else would have to chair. See, so even to make a comment on a, on a, little, on a relatively limited point, he has to leave the chair. Kind of interesting here that the chairperson is, is kind of put into a, a spot where he really he can't hardly speak in favor of something or against it, he can't hardly vote. Uh, this is part of his duty, the impartiality required of the chair. So if you're going to be the chairperson, you, you have to be impartial. It's not like, well, you can be if you want to be. The chair has to be impartial. So if the pastor of every church is, uh, in the, is the chairperson automatically, uh, according, according to this, then that means that every pastor is required to be impartial and to be fair there in the board to all the members. Does that make sense? See, that's the way the church is supposed to work. Now, there is an exception in what's usually called a small board or a committee. If you're sitting around the table with five or six people in a committee, you know, a lot of this stuff, yeah, you don't need to second everything. Uh, you don't, the, the chair can participate in the discussion and that's considered normal. Nobody's against that. Usually a committee like that winds up sending its report back to the board anyway. So there, there again, the, the limitations on power prevail at the board level. But if it's a small committee, why? If it's a committee, then that's fine. Now, what if it's a called a small board? Then Robert's Rules tells us that yes, then the chairperson can actually can be involved in some measure in the debate. Well, how would you know though that something was, uh, that your board is a small board? Well, I'll tell you one way right now. Yeah, in page 35 or page 488 here, you'll find that um, that every motion is that's made has to be seconded. The chair can't do that. But if you're in a case uh, where you're in a small board, a, a motion doesn't have to be seconded. So let me ask you, how are things in your church? In your church board meeting, uh, does, it, does a motion have to be seconded? If, if a motion has to be seconded, then you're not a small board, you're a regular board in this way. And so that means the pastor then is limited. He cannot function in a way that he's showing partiality. He has to be fair, fair handed to everybody. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. If you're gonna be the pastor, you, you have to be impartial. It's your duty, it's an absolute. So if people are seconding motions in your board, then the pastor is bound by this. This means you're not a small board. You may be a, a physically small board, a numerically small board, but you're operating as a regular board. So the pastor maintains a position of neutrality. Now I did mention that the pastor does have the right to vote, and that's true, he has the right to vote, but he sets that aside while he's chair. But there actually are a couple of cases where he could vote as the chair. So if it's a secret ballot, there would be a place. Uh, if it is a case where there's a vote, and let's say there's a margin of one, let's say that nine people vote against it and 10 people vote in favor of that motion. Now the chair is the tiebreaker, and he can then vote, he can take and he can add his vote so that instead of nine versus 10 and the majority wins and the motion passes, he can say, I vote no, 
And that means it's 10 versus 10, and on a tie uh, vote like that, the motion, you don't have a majority, so the motion fails. So the chairperson can actually kill a 50-50 margin vote, or if if he, one vote was needed to make a, a tie, which would be a fail, into a majority, the pastor can actually vote for that and cause it to pass. Most smart pastors don't want to be the guy that when the church is split 50-50, the pastor doesn't want to be the guy who uh, tilts it over to one side or the other. Most pastors in a case like that would probably stay with abstain. They just simply don't vote, and so their vote isn't counted, and they, they let the board decide. You as the pastor, when you become the pastor, you want to, you, these people are the church. Pastors come and go. The church more or less stays, stays there. You need, to, you need to let them be led by God and work their, and run their church. The pastor shouldn't come in and, and be giving orders and barking orders right and left, and it's got to be my way. That's, 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 that's looking for trouble. That's not the way it was in the early church. Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. That's the way the Gentiles do it. That's not the way we do it. Hey, I want to put on the screen uh, just a few, just take a moment here with some hints for uh, a productive board meeting. Um, have a regular schedule. Make sure that your church members know when your board meeting is. Have open meetings, right? Provide your board members with an agenda uh, a week ahead or even further. Uh, the pastor, usually, or the pastor in combination with the head elder or something, they'll set the agenda. And so uh, be, be receptive. If people want to put something on the agenda, by all means, um, most of the time you're going to want to just add it to the agenda. At the beginning of your meeting, pray specifically that the Holy Spirit will guide, guide the board in their meeting. Uh, we do this in every board meeting, and in, I believe God answers our prayers for his help. Another thing is adopt an agenda. You know, you send out a draft agenda a week ahead. Uh, but also, when you start your meeting, it might be that something, something has to be added or changed or something, so you work with the people right there. If there's anything that the group agrees to add to the agenda, then it's added, and then you, uh, you vote on that adopted agenda. Once you've got that agenda adopted, you can't be adding any major items, like some, somebody walks in halfway through and has some giant initiative that's going to spend wads of money that nobody's thought about, and suddenly you have to do it and everybody's tired. You don't want that. You want things to be prayed out, careful. So adopt an agenda and stick to it along the way. Next board meeting, you can bring up the new business. Now I want to come to one other spot here, and that is what if the pastor is commanded by the employing conference to act unethically toward his church or in his church? See, the church has obligations toward the congregation, and there is not a time when the pastor or the conference president or the conference executive committee there's not a time when they have any authority whatsoever to violate the obligations of the church members. They just don't. It's, they just don't. So if, if a pastor is commanded, okay, disregard what the board says, throw out this decision, uh, force them to adopt this policy, force them to do this evangelistic meeting. If, if somebody were to command that, I mean, how did that person ever become a president, a conference president? But anyway, if it does happen, guess what? What, what then? What about the pastor? Because he's employed, and this guy's his boss, so to speak, but, but wait a minute. Page 28 said in the church manual, the authority rests in the membership. So the only reason that person's conference president or that that person's a ministerial director, the only reason that that is there is because the, the people have granted him that authority on a, on a limited basis. He, they've never, he's never been granted authority to, to go against the church manual or to go against fair process. So anyway, a pastor could be faced with that situation. You have to do this or you know what, we'll, we'll discontinue your employment. What then? Well, then the church pastor is in the same situation as every other member who maybe is faced with a, 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 the, the Sabbath. Uh, he, he's faced with an ultimatum. Look, you have to come in on Saturdays uh, for your work because I, we just don't have anybody else. You have to come in and help us. Either that or we're just gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to discontinue your employment. And a person may be facing, uh, a church member can just be facing that issue. Well, uh, it's my job. I won't be able to feed my family. I have to make the, the ethical decision. I have to do the decision that Jesus, Jesus would do. What would that be? Well, we know what that would be. Jesus would trust in the Lord and he would not break God's Sabbath commandment. So the pastor could be in the very same place deciding whether he can ethically even work for that 
church organization, that sisterhood of churches anymore with that person, those particular leaders in there because he has to be ethical. If there's one person in your congregation, I mean, every person has to be ethical. But once you get into the church officers, there's a whole other level of expectation that they are straight and faithful. And once you get to the elders, I mean, there's a whole other level of expectation that they will be absolute. And then you come to the pastor. So the pastor has to decide that he will be true to the authorities that he has been given and not to the things he might be commanded to do that he, he does not have authority to do. So the pastor might have to go and work in another conference. It has happened that sometimes the pastors had to move, you know, 2,000 miles from, from one place to another uh, because he couldn't work in that conference anymore. Not because he did anything wrong, but because he was determined to get him out. And you know what? God is our ultimate helper. Uh, I sure wouldn't want to be a bully on the day of judgment, especially having bullied some of God's servants. Above all, a pastor has to be an honest man, a person of integrity. Pray for your pastors. Don't become adversary with your pastor. Work with your pastor. Almost all the time, they're gonna to wanna to work with you. If conference leaders, by the way, are willing to break their commitments, their obligations to a congregation, uh, let me tell you, I have, I have a zero policy on that. They should be approached and they should correct themselves. They should repent and change. But if they don't do that, if they continue in being unfair to members or congregations, they should simply be taken and removed by the church, by the constituency of the conference. The, the people that work in the conference office have to have the highest integrity, okay? We're all human. Yes, we make mistakes, but but uh, they need to guard the rights of the members, guard the obligations of the church. So that'll be a whole nother section here where we talk about what to do if your conference leadership is so far uh, away from where they need to be that they actually, the leaders may need to be uh, put into a different task rather than into leadership. We'll talk about that. But today we're just talking about the relationship of the pastor, the limitations on the pastor's authority with the church board, Work with your pastor, let him work with you. Don't let him overrun you, don't let him override you. Uh, remember that we're all in this, we're all brethren, and we are seeking God's will for his local church uh, together. And the pastor is called, and I read it before, and I, maybe that's the thing to conclude with. Because the pastor is appointed to the position in the church by the conference, the pastor serves the church as a conference employee, is responsible to the conference executive committee, and maintains a sympathetic and cooperative relation to and works in harmony with all the plans and policies of the local church. How many of those policies was I as pastor supposed to work with? The world church says all the plans and policies of the local church. Well, what about the stuff from the conference? When the conference wants, wants us to advertise a meeting on religious liberty, when the conference wants us to advertise this meeting or that thing, of course, we should cooperate. The pastor is there to cooperate with the conference and do to try to pass all those, to make sure those things are passed on. And the, but the pastor is called to help the local church with its local plans. And that is something he should guard and protect. You know, there is very little that couldn't be corrected if, if you lay people, if you church members, so the authority rests in the membership. There's very little that couldn't be dramatically corrected in the church if, if you were more muscular, if you were a little bit more vital in, in helping us all come up, come up to the line, come up stronger and holding our feet to the fire, your pastor, your conference leaders, your union leaders, that, you know, you guys bring us up to the line and, and, and the Lord will bless it. If you just let us just do our own thing and lead you our own way and disregard all these things, you're going to have chaos and destruction and the church will come to pieces. You, you, you've, got to, you've got to come up to the line, guys. You need to help your church. And God may be at this time is calling you to come up to the line. Help your local church. Help your local conference to be where God wants us to be. God bless you. See you maybe next week. And we probably turn our attention to constituency meetings. I'm not quite in the order I had planned, but we'll talk about constituency meetings so that some of you can be equipped for the constituency meetings that are imminent uh, in your location. There's some things that will be helpful to know. And some of the things uh, we need to talk about 
um, some of the reasons why rights are guarded via parliamentary procedure. Talk about a few of the main motions that are normally not talked about, but, uh, but you, if you understand just a few small things, it could help you transform your, your conference, your union.